Good. How are you today? Good. I'm asking each individual, how are you today? Good. Thank you for coming. This is a great crowd. Uh, we are we are super excited for this. Um, I'm, I'm sure Matt and Sarah are going to talk a little more about the program, but uh, we heard about this a couple months ago, and we knew we wanted to bring it to the Forest Park, and the turnout is absolutely wonderful. There's still more people coming in, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this is worthwhile information. You can't go a single day out of without hearing about somebody getting scammed or fraud. Um, it, it just happened to a friend of mine last week. She lost $200 over Facebook um, because she, someone has asked for a down payment on some, on some furniture. Um, so it, it, it's out there. They get you. I don't care who you are. I don't care how old you are. I don't, I don't care how old. It doesn't matter. It's out there, so this is such great information. Um, thank you to Wake Cross Media. They're going to be broadcasting this on YouTube. I will send the link out so that you can share this and you can watch it again. But also, please share. Let your friends and family know that it is such worthwhile information. So we'll go ahead and get started. I will turn it over to Matt. He's with the Hamilton County Prosecutor's Office. Um, there is a sign-up sheet going around. That is a for a weekly newsletter from the Hamilton County monthly 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 newsletter <laughs> from the Hamilton County Prosecutor's Office. One day week. <laughs> uh, I signed up for it a couple months ago, and every time I've gotten, I've learned something from it. Uh, so uh, they will not give out your information. That's what this is all about. Not sharing your information. So, uh, but again, just great information there. So sign up for that. Make sure you fill out the uh, uh, for the gift card. You got a little pink. Uh, or the red uh, um, raffle tickets, thank you. Uh, and then we got refreshments in the back. So we'll go ahead and get started. We'll turn it over to Matt. Thank you very much. How's everybody doing today? Can everybody hear me first off? Yes. Okay, great. Um, my name is Matt Brew. I'm with the Hamilton County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. I work for Prosecutor Melissa Powers. Uh, thank you all for coming out here today. I hope that at the end of this, you'll have learned something and that you will make yourself a harder target for scammers to take advantage of because, like we just heard, it quite literally can happen to anyone. So I work for the Elder Justice Unit in Hamilton County. This is a little video we made to intro what the concept is. All of us have aging parents, and we, and we all want the, them to be safe. And there's nothing worse than being taken advantage of when you know that they're vulnerable. We are establishing a helpline, which is 513-946-SCAM. This helpline can be used for a number of purposes. One, to report scams. One, if you think you've been targeted as a scam. And then we can spread that word. This office will spread that word out through social media or the media itself to law enforcement to be able to make sure that that information is out there to our seniors and then their, their family members as well, that people are aware of it. You see it on TV all the time about um, these different scams that are going around and how people are being duped. Well, it's very, very hard to prosecute say a telephone type of scam because those are coming off the dark web, they're from another country. We can't necessarily catch those people and prosecute, but when you're dealing with the elderly, we can educate them. We can, we can make, give them awareness, we can inform the community um, and to be able to provide that help and then that is our way of empowering them. Thank you to Prosecutor Powers for uh, again recognizing and acknowledging that uh, senior scams are a problem uh, in our community throughout the United States and uh, launching this initiative. I hope everyone will use the new 946 scam hotline to report issues that can be investigated. Thank you, Melissa, and the entire prosecutor's office for identifying this as an urgent issue for our community. The message to those people that want to take advantage of seniors is that we're going to prosecute you. We're going to, we've got a special unit. We're coming after you, and it's just not going to be tolerated here in Hamilton County. So. The Elder Justice Unit is a new initiative that was started by Prosecutor Melissa Powers in 2000, uh, 2023, just last year. And it's interesting to me, um, when we talk about being a prosecutor, we talk about the court system and fighting against crime, one of the first things we're taught about is vulnerable populations and how we have a duty 
as people in law enforcement, as people that work in the court system, to protect the most vulnerable in our community. And coming up as a younger attorney, the number one group that we always heard about was children, that we have to fight on behalf of children, that we have to work on behalf of children. And that's not to say that that's not an important task. It really is. But there is an entire other spectrum of the population that had been frankly ignored by our justice system, uh, both locally and nationally until very recently. And so when Prosecutor Powers took over in 2023 uh, as our Hamilton County prosecutor, this was one of her first initiatives. And when she did this, it was kind of like a light went off in all of our heads at the same time. Like, man, why haven't we been paying closer attention to this beforehand? I frankly felt embarrassed. The Elder Justice Unit that was formed by Prosecutor Powers is a team of attorneys and support staff that has a goal of prosecuting crimes that are committed against the elderly, but also engaging in community outreach to our senior population and people who care for seniors in order to stop them from becoming victims of crime in the first place. Um, a little bit about me, since you're gonna have to listen to me for the duration of this presentation. Uh, once again, my name is Matt Brew. I work at the Hamilton County Prosecutor's Office for the majority of my career, I was a criminal prosecutor. Uh, just about every court that you can imagine in this county, from parking tickets all the way up to homicides, I've practiced in. Um, I've tried numerous jury trials. I thought that was going to be my career path going forward until Prosecutor Powers asked me to lead this new division. I um, couldn't be more pleased to be doing it. I couldn't be more pleased to be here speaking to groups of people like you, hopefully making it so that people like me don't have a job. There would be nothing better than if we had no crimes to prosecute. That would be a wonderful thing. I can go and I can you know, find a real line of work. Um, I am the chief of the Elder Justice Unit. When it was formed though, we got a lot of questions like why now? Why create an Elder Justice Unit right now? Why is this so important? And I think this next video kind of explains that in better detail and in better terms than I could ever possibly hope to. A fake Amazon purchase and bank wire transfers. That's how a local family said scammers were able to steal more than a half million dollars from them. An elderly Knoxville woman has fallen victim to one of the most expensive fraud cases that we've ever reported on. Hoping to collect her pot of gold, she has lost $190,000 to a scammer. Scams are still running rampant across the country. One woman says she was taken in by the so-called romance scam. 56,000 people fell victim to it last year alone. Looking for love and winding up broke. Americans lost a staggering $1.3 billion to romance scams last year, and an Orange County woman lost millions. This next story is about financial devastation. A King County man went from having $800,000 in his bank account to being homeless in just a few days. Investigators say it's all due to scammers. Joan got to a point where she couldn't pay her mortgage. She sold her life insurance policy, borrowed from family and friends. How much did you lose? I lost $27,000. It's a great loss. Is there any more money? I don't have any more money. I don't have money for gas, for food, and for rent. I'm completely broke. April 25th, he sold his house. On the 26th, he had $800,000, and then by May 3rd, he had zero. The total loss, $690,500. I had the money. I had the $430,000 in my bank account, in the savings account. Then I had owned a house, $650,000. I got a reverse mortgage on it after I spent all the money in the $430,000. Then I just kept sending money. You know, we're, we're good people. You know, we're good people. We've worked hard all our life. You know, leave the elderly alone. The really sad part was that it took me less than one page of Google search results to put that video compilation together. And there are page after page after page of stories being reported just like those around the country in every community. The FBI keeps data on this, and the data is sobering. The most recent information we have is from their crime report in 2022. We're hopefully going to get the 2023 report here shortly. But the 2022 report indicated that there was a staggering $3.1 billion 
that was reported as losses due to scams targeting individuals over the age of 65. And when you dive deeper into these numbers, all of the data, all of the research, all of the information tells us one thing, and that's that this number is considered to be grossly underreported. Um, and can anyone guess why that would be? Shame. Embarrassment. Embarrassment and being ashamed. When you look at the literature on this subject, the number one thing that you see reported from when they talk to seniors who have been scammed but don't report it to law enforcement is that there is a sense of shame that is attached to being a victim of one of these scams, especially when, in many cases, it, with the benefit of hindsight, it seems very obvious that you were being scammed at the time. But wrapped up in these scams, when you're in the middle of it, it can be very difficult to notice what seems obvious later on. Additionally, the literature tells us another thing, and that there is a sense of fear over reporting these scams that leads seniors to not report them. And the specific fear is the fear of loss of control. Because when these scams are reported, one of the first action items that is suggested by friends or especially by family is, well, maybe we need someone to take care of your finances or help you manage your money. Um, that loss of control, that loss of ability to manage your own life affairs is devastating for seniors to experience or even to be discussed. And the numbers really tell us that it's completely unnecessary and completely unfounded. If you actually look, and the FBI breaks this data down by age group, if you look, you can see that people are targeted by scams at all phases of their life. In fact, the number one total victim count on that list is people between the ages of 30 and 39, millennials, the people who claim that they invented the internet and are the best at the internet. Um, the issue, though, and why it's so particularly damaging for seniors is that if you look at the numbers right here, the number of scams that target seniors is way too high of a number. But if you look at the loss right there, the average loss per scam is way higher with seniors than it is with any other age demographic there. And what makes this particularly devastating, and this is something that I don't need to tell you all, but that if you are scammed and you are 35 years old and you lose $30,000, $40,000, that's devastating. That's financially awful. We wouldn't wish that on anyone. But you have 25, 30, possibly 40 additional working years where you can recoup the losses that you suffer from a scam. If you are scammed out of that same amount of money at age 75 or 80, there is very little hope that you are going to be able to recover financially from that loss or remake the money that you have lost, which makes it even more devastating for this population group. Um, also hard to hear from the numbers is that the state of Ohio is number six in the United States, according to FBI data, for total amount of scams targeting seniors. Number six is a, a good number if you're the Ohio State basketball team or Xavier or UC. It is not a good number in this space, unfortunately. Um, I think maybe Xavier had six wins all year this year. I don't know. It wasn't good. So I'm a season ticket holder. I'm not bitter. Um, the question comes up a lot. You're a prosecutor. You work in the system. Instead of talking about this, why don't you do something about it? Um, take action, do something, lock the bad guys up. Why is that so hard in this space, do you guys think? We don't report. Well, you don't report them, that's number one. But even if you do report them, the number one issue that faces us when it comes to talking about scams targeting seniors is that scammers operate on a global scale. It just is a reality of the modern society that we live in. We have never been more interconnected. The tools that allow people to do things from across the ocean or wherever in the globe that impacts us here locally, those tools have never been better or more effective. And if you look at the literature, the literature bears this out as well in terms of where these scams originate from. It's mostly in the third and developing world. India, for example, the New York Times did a big expose on this. They are the number one source of call center scams and tech support scams. And can anyone think of why that would be in particular with India? They speak English. They speak English. That's 
a huge part of this as well is that English is spoken as a native language in India for the most part. There's so many of them. There are a lot of them. <laughs> I mean, there's only so many legitimate jobs to go around in any given place. That's absolutely true. The other big thing is, I don't know if you've had this experience as well, but long about 20, 25 years ago, it seemed like overnight when you had a problem with a corporation or a company and you called to get help, if you were, you know, your flight got canceled or something like that, it seemed like instantaneously overnight, every company switched to their call center would route your call to someone who claimed their name was Bob or Chris and that they were in South Carolina, but really they were speaking with a very heavy accent and you could tell that this person wasn't working in the United States. The big buzzword at the time was a word called offshoring or outsourcing. So American corporations, in a sense, trained an entire generation of workers in places like India on how to talk to Americans and deal with Americans over the phone, how to solve their problems, how to de-escalate, how to convince them that they were working to fix their problem. And so after a couple of decades of this type of work existing over there, now we have a certain group of people who have been trained and can decide, you know what, I don't want to make $25 or $50 a day working for Delta and dealing with people who are mad they're stuck in Atlanta because their flight got canceled. Instead, I would rather work uh, with going to business for myself and do this less legitimately and more illegally. And the technology has allowed this to happen too. When we first sent all these jobs overseas, you had to have phone lines connected to each one of these individual phones that people were answering as they got screamed at because windows kept crashing or something was wrong with their computer. Now, you can have one computer connected to the internet, and that computer has the ability to call thousands of numbers at the exact same time, allowing one person to do the work it used to take a room full of people to do. So, we see a rise, an enormous rise, in call center and tech support scams coming from India. Russia, the uh, literature tells us, is the number one source of what are called romance scams, and we're going to talk about that a little bit better a little bit here in a second. And again, this makes sense. It seems like you couldn't go a week without hearing a story a few years ago about how Russia was on social media, how they were infiltrating and steering the course of conversation in this country with bots and people sitting on computers, making things up and pretending to be Americans. Well, a lot of those same skills are good at luring Americans or luring people into conversations pretending to be fictitious people. We, in a sense, they, in a sense, were trained on how to do this type of scam by virtue of other things happening politically in that country. Cambodia is one of the largest sources of what are called pig butchering scams, and we're going to talk about that here in a second. But what's actually horrifying is that the literature tells us that in Cambodia, a great many of the people that are scammers are, in fact, victims of scams themselves, where there are people from other countries like Thailand or China who are lured to Cambodia with the promise of legitimate work, and then when they arrive in the country, they find out the people luring them there were cartels, they are, their documents are seized, and they are forced into a form of human slavery where they have to work off the debt they owe for coming to the country by scamming money out of people like you. Um, it is a global web of crime, dishonesty, and some of the most unsavory and worst people you would ever want to interact with. And they all have one goal, and that is targeting people like you to try and steal your money. And of course, the problem with this is that that means they operate beyond the reach of many federal authorities and local authorities. So I work for the Hamilton County Prosecutor's Office. My jurisdiction ends at the county line of Hamilton. You go out to Goshen or you go up to Westchester, that's something I have no control over. I have no authority to prosecute crimes or investigate crimes up there. We have a state attorney general, Dave Yost, but his authority ends at the borders of the state of Ohio. We have a US attorney general whose authority ends at the borders of the United States. Anything beyond that requires cooperation from international authorities. And by show of hands, how many people here think Russia is really eager to help the United States investigate Russian citizens and criminals? <laughs> No, that's not going to happen. In many of these places, it's, it's no coincidence that these are areas in the third and developing world where it is very easy for criminals to make sure that they remain willfully unseen, I'll say generously, 
There are stories you can read, you don't have to dig deep onto the internet to find it, of people such as the individuals in Cambodia, where even when they attempt to get help, when they attempt to free themselves from the situation they're in, the police come, accept a bribe from the cartel, and then the cost of the bribe is just added to this person's total that they have to earn to buy their freedom back. Um, so the question becomes, should we just give up? I mean, if there's no point in doing this, if we can't arrest these individuals, if we can't prosecute these individuals, wouldn't we be better off just sort of shutting down and focusing on the crimes we can actually do something about? Anyone think that's a good idea at all? No? I think Bart and Lisa are feeling a little upset right now. Isn't there something you'd like to say? There sure is. Kids, you tried your best and you failed miserably. The lesson is never try. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually funny. Um, we have one of the better technology setups in here in terms of audio and visual places I've given this presentation. And I gave it at a location down closer to Clifton a couple months ago. And the audio wasn't working on that clip. And there was one person who was like, oh, I know the words for this by heart because I've seen every episode of The Simpsons. And he just took the microphone and finished the clip off. <laughs> the answer, of course, is education which is another one of the missions and one of the main missions of the Elder Justice Unit. If we cannot stop the scammers by arresting them, we can stop the scammers by making all of the people in our community harder targets. The idea of being a hard target, that was something that was a big buzzword back around uh, 2001 after the terrorist attacks, is that what we are going to do is we are going to make it harder for terrorists or people to come after us by doing things like improving our security, you know, having more checkpoints, asking more questions, you know, just better, generally being more aware of what these people are up to. And much the same strategy works in terms of scammers, is educating you on not only what the types of scams are, but also what things you can do to recognize them while they're happening to you, and also to take preventative steps to stop yourself from being scammed. So what we're gonna do over the course of this presentation, now that we've gotten a little backstory on how scams come to be, is we're going to go over some of the most common types of scams that you may see targeting you in your everyday life. Uh, some of these scams we know are operating locally. Some of these are based on national literature. Uh, and the important thing to remember about all these scams is that scams are like an up and down wave. Is that there may be a scam right now that is in the popular culture or in the zeitgeist that is happening actively. And then all the news stories start to cover it and people get wise to the scam and it goes down like this. And then all of a sudden, everybody starts talking about you know, Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. We have a, our national interest is like that of a mosquito. And once everybody stops paying attention to the scam, all of a sudden, it starts coming back up again. So everything is cyclical in this space. And you, so you'll hear about some scams you might not have heard about. You'll hear about some scams that I guarantee you have heard about. Uh, and I can guarantee you one thing, too, and that's that all of these scams will pop up again, because everything old is always new at some point. So the first scam we're going to talk about is one of the most basic scams out there that I think everybody, whether you know it or not, has been targeted for. And that's called a tech support scam. So by show of hands here, how many people here own and use a computer? All right, keep your hands in the air. By show of hands, how many people have ever gotten an email that says your computer may be infected with a virus? All right. This is when you receive that notification of an email that says your computer may be infected with a virus, or this can also manifest itself as you're on the web and a pop-up happens that sort of hijacks your screen and says your computer has been infected with something. This is the start of what's known as a tech support scam. Because whenever you get this email, you get this notification, it is always accompanied by something that is corrective action. Please call this number. Please click on this link to fix it. And what that is, is that is the way that the scammer is attempting to get contact with you. And all of these scams, this, all these scams are predicated on the idea of you getting in contact with a scammer or a scammer talking to you. Their number one goal in all instances is to get you talking, get you on the phone, and get information out of you. That can lead to them either getting money or getting your personal information. When you get this email, the scammer poses as someone from tech support. 
So you get the email and it says your computer's been infected with a virus. You get the pop-up that says your computer's been infected with a virus. When you call, you are routed to the scammer who poses as someone working for a trusted corporation. The number one corporation they pose as, and I don't know why this is, is, is McAfee, uh, McAfee virus software. I think that they are using the fact that that used to be a trusted name in computing back in the 90s that we all associate with virus protection. If not them, then Microsoft, in some cases Apple. And when you call, they will walk you through the process of fixing your computer. That can take a number of forms. That can either mean you giving control of them, or they, your mouse starts moving on its own, or it can include you downloading a software fix for your computer, which is in reality almost always a program that allows them to have access to your computer at a later date. The goal of a tech support scam is to try and get access to your computer because your computer contains incredibly valuable data about yourself. We keep bank records on our computers, tax information on our computers, social security numbers, personal identifying information. And then the goal of the scammer is to get all the contents of your hard drive downloaded and uploaded to their servers where they have software that goes through all of your files looking for specific information, looking for your name, rank, and serial number, any document that has your social in it, any document that has your address, your phone numbers, contacts of other people that they can then add to call lists for future scamming. And then all of this data is aggregated. They take up all the data that they've stolen and they sell this on places called, uh, at places called the dark web, which are basically just internet sites that you need special access to go to. You need to download special browsers. It's mostly for criminals, almost always for criminals. But that's the goal of the tech support scam. What you need to know about a tech support scam and how to stop, prevent yourself from being scammed by a tech support scam is that as it stands right now in 2024, there is no way for any computer company to know that there is a problem with your computer remotely unless you give them access to look at it. Microsoft, Apple, Android, any company that you have software from does not have remote monitoring so ability to check your computer remotely unless you give them permission to do it. So if you get an email saying your computer has a problem and you have never given anyone access to look at your computer remotely, that email is a lie, that notification is a lie. It is just designed to try and get you on the phone with a tech support scammer or get you doing something to give up your credentials to give access to your computer. It is always a scam. If you get a browser window that hijacks your computer, there are various ways that this can happen that are completely nefarious but otherwise don't impact the rest of your computer. The answer is to turn your computer off and turn it back on. That will fix 99.9% .9 of the problems. <laughs> Seriously, like there's a fun story or a fun video that I watched the other day about a guy that works in tech support legitimately. And they can't just tell you when you call, oh, just turn it off and turn it on again because you'll get really frustrated with that answer because of course you can figure that out on your own. But that's the answer. So what they will do is they will tell you to take like, all right, click here, open this, switch this setting, now switch it back again. All right, now you need to do a power cycle for the updates to take effect. Well, you didn't do anything. Like, none of the changes needed a restart. They just told you all this stuff to make you feel like you were doing something before they told you to restart your computer. Um, nerds, man, they'll be the death of us all. Okay. Yes? Okay, what if you mm -hmm. have been scammed in that capacity? Like, some, I had a, um, a printer that didn't work and they told me to call support and he took control of my computer, but the problem never got fixed. So what do you do in that case? What do you do in that case? The question was, what do you do if for some reason there is this, this scam does uh, impact you, where you call a tech support person, they take control of your computer like this? Um, what I would do is I would immediately change as many of my login credentials as possible. I would change all of the passwords that I have that I'm using. I would contact, um, my, I would contact my bank and ask for my bank accounts to be changed. At that point, once that happens to you, you have to assume that every piece of information on your computer is now in the hands of a scammer. So I would change your login information, I would change your passwords, I would call your credit card companies and change your credit card. I would treat it as if your house had been robbed and broken into at that point, just because that's the sheer amount of data on your computer. Um, and then at that point, that would be something where I would consider 
talking to a company that does identity theft protection, like LifeLock, they're pretty decent, um, and just start to monitor your credit a little more. There's a couple of tips we're gonna get into later that I think would be good in this space, so that's a free preview of a little bit of where we're going here. Um, the next type of scam we're gonna talk about are sweepstakes scams or lottery scams. These were pop very, very popular about five to 10 years ago. So by show of hands, how many people here have ever been contacted and told you have won a fabulous cash prize in some other country or a big inheritance? Or this is also a cousin of the, um, how many people here found out they were related to a Nigerian prince about 10 years ago? <laughs> Me too. I'm, I'm <laughs> who knew? Ancestry.com was lying to me. <laughs> Um, they're all forms of the same type of scam, and that is these are prize scams. In these scams, and these still operate, they're not as big as they were about 10, 15 years ago, but they're still operating, they're still happening. In this type of scam, an individual is contacted and told they have won some sort of a prize, a settlement, a lottery winning, or some sort of a sweepstakes. But, yes ma'am? I received one of those checks. I didn't understand and that. And it was written on a PNC bank check. Ooh. So I took it to the bank. What did PNC have to say about that? Well, they researched the address, and the address was from an auto shop in a different country. <laughs> she said that she received a PNC bank check from, a different, from an auto shop outside of the country. That's par for the course. There's, I'll get to this in a second here. But the bottom line with these sweepstakes scams is that they tell you that you've won some sort of a cash prize. But there's always a but. But in order to get your money, what do you have to do? You have to send them some money. The number one way that they, the number one, and it's just they, they all run a playbook. And I can tell you with almost absolute certainty, the first thing you will always be told is that before we can send you your money, you have to pay the taxes that there are taxes owed on your winnings and we cannot send you that money until you pay the taxes. And so they'll ask you for some nominal amount of money. If you're winning $80 million, they're gonna say, look, just $50,000 in taxes and this money is yours. And if you pay the $50,000, how many people here think you actually get your 80 million? No. What you get instead is you get another ask for money because now you have um, demonstrated that you have money, that you will pay, and they'll ask you for something else. It'll be okay, you've paid the taxes, but now we need to talk about the attorney's fees. The lawyer's always gotta get paid, right? <laughs> um, we would love to send you this money, but our lawyers are insisting you have to pay the legal fees, and it'll just be $25,000 more. And then, after that, there will be another reason why they need money. Now, now we have to pay a special handling fee or a wire transfer fee, and this goes on and on and on. With these scams, though, it seems incredibly obvious in hindsight there's no money here. You look back after you've sent this, all this money and you think to yourself, how could I have been so stupid to get you know, wrapped up in this? The reason why is, this is the first of our little psychology education sessions here. Um, how many people here have ever heard of a concept called the sunk cost fallacy? All right, we got one. Sunk cost fallacy, sunk, S-U-N-K, sunk cost. The sunk cost fallacy is just the way our brains worked. It's been well researched in psychology, and that's that we are really, really bad as people. And that's all of us, just it's a species thing. It's something evolutionarily, I don't understand it. My wife teaches science, she probably, probably knows all about this. Um, in our brains, we are bad at breaking things down into a discrete series of events. We always want to view decisions as part of a spectrum that this decision leads to this decision leads to this decision, and we're gonna consider all of the information past and present before making a decision versus looking at each decision individually. This is, in fact, the reason why they have a very nice casino downtown, the Hard Rock, and why Las Vegas is a thing. Because we don't have the ability, or we are bad at this idea of, well, I sent the scammers $50,000. They're asking for 25,000. I can't not send them that money. If I don't send them that, the $50,000 I sent them is gone. It's the idea of chasing bad money with good money. Fortune 500 CEOs make this mistake all the time. It's why companies go bankrupt. It's our own brains working against us. When you are in the middle of a scam like this, once you have given that first time, 
the odds of you giving a second time go up because people think to themselves, I have to keep paying, otherwise I wasted that money originally. When in reality, that money was gone the second you sent it, and you have to evaluate each decision of, is this a good idea to send more money on its own? But we don't do that. This is scammers using our own brains against us to lure us into giving more money. And they're very good at this. There was a, uh, a case I consulted on from uh, St. Bernard, uh, one of the detectives out there that I work with a lot. He called me, and this was right before Christmas, about a woman that was involved in one of these scams, these lottery scams, where she was paying, thinking that she had won a, a lottery settlement in the Caribbean, I think. So she had paid $50,000 to the scammer. She had paid an additional $10,000 to the scammer, and they had asked her for more money again. And she had said to the police, I was worried I was getting scammed. <laughs> well done. But what happened that changed her mind was that she received a check in the mail for $500. And a, a, note from, and a call from the scammer saying, uh, it turns out you overpaid us by $500. We're remitting the cost back to you. And in that moment, she thought, well, I'm not being scammed. If it was scammers, they'd just keep my money. And she paid them the next 10000 after that. They are always thinking. They always have something new and some new wrinkle to this, but it remains the same. If you, if you get a call that says you have won money, first off, instant suspicion at that point. Like, that, I don't know about you, I am not that lucky of a person. Like, no one's calling to offer me free money ever. Instant suspicion. And if you get that call that you are going to win a lot of money, your first call needs to be to someone professional to double check that it's legitimate. You should immediately be suspicious, you should immediately disbelieve it, but on the off chance that you think there's a possibility that it's real, you should contact your bank or you should contact a financial planner. If you're gonna win $80 million and your first call isn't to a stockbroker, <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. These are all types of scams that are called, that fall into the broader category of trust scams or pig butchering scams. The goal of these scams is to gain your trust. The sweepstakes people want you to trust that there is money at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the process, that there is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. All of these types of trust scams are referred to as uh, pig butchering scams. This is a term that's getting a lot more play in the media lately, which I'm very happy about. It originates as a term that's Chinese. This is a translation from a Chinese term because a great many of these scams originated in China. The idea of a pig butchering scam is that scammers are going to invest their time gaining your trust so that when they eventually ask you for money or scam you, that trust will allow them to ask for more money than they otherwise would be able to if it was just a scatterscot approach. The idea is that they view you as a hog they are fattening up for slaughter. I want you to remember that mental image because you never want to be the hog, believe me. The number one form of these right now targeting seniors are what are called romance scams. By a show of hands, how many people here have heard of a romance scam before? Okay, just about everyone. A romance scam is the fastest growing type of scam targeting seniors. Uh, it was an over 80% increase between 2020 and 2021. And can anybody guess why that is? Well, people are living longer. That's, not, that's a great point. Old folks need love too. Old folks need love too. <laughs> I haven't heard it put so succinctly at any of the talks yet, but that's... Sure, absolutely. Look. Um, the number one reason is, and I think I heard somebody at the back shout it out, is COVID. So in 2020, we all went into lockdown together, and there were a lot of lessons I think our society learned during COVID, um, and without getting political or contentious about this, I think the number one lesson we all learned as a society that I think we can all agree on is that human beings are social creatures, that human beings crave other people for the most part. We want to be around people. We want to see friends, we want to see family, we want to interact with others. It's the reason why within like 20 minutes of the governor saying everything was shut down, all of a sudden everyone became an expert on how to use Zoom. Like I'd, I'd, never used, I'd never used video conferencing software in my life. I don't want to have to like put clothes on to talk to somebody, that's absurd. 
Um, but yet, here I found myself sitting on the couch with my wife, drink in hand on four little boxes on my computer screen with other friends also drinking together over a video chat program. We all found a way to keep having social experiences with one another. And seniors were no different. There has always been a culture since the internet emerged of internet dating culture, internet meeting culture, and that used to be pretty limited. It used to be a couple different programs or websites you could go to to meet people. But during the pandemic, it exploded with various niche groups where no matter what group you fell into, no matter what your population demographic was, there suddenly became an app for you. And that was no different with seniors. And all of a sudden, there was a proliferation of places where seniors could meet people online, whether that was for a romantic connection, you know, because seniors need love too, or just meeting a new friend to talk to. And so because of that, you had an entirely new group of people entering into this space looking to meet people who might not have been as familiar with how the social norms on this sort of thing work as their counterparts who had been doing this for years. And so as a result, scammers found this as a fertile territory. In a romance scam, scammers will pose as romantic companions or friends of people online in an effort to gain their trust. And these scams can last months or even years before people make an ask for money or do something to target someone. Yes, ma'am. I don't know how many people watched Dr. Phil, but there was a nice lady who did the Someone told her and gained her trust that she was married to Tyler Perry. <laughs> 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 they never met. They didn't know each other. She's married. Was she married to Tyler Perry or Medea? That's the real. <laughs> I mean, I. One of those two is pretty scandalous, actually. <laughs> A romance scam. Yeah, oh, it's it can. No, just buy his movies. You don't need to send him any money. <laughs> Go get a ticket. <laughs> um, romance scams usually progress a uh, pretty standard way. The first part of a romance scam is always rapport building, conversations between two individuals about basic facts of their life, getting to know you, the same thing you would do with people that you were just meeting for the first time. Although some of the questions when you hear them said out loud on a lot of these conversations don't seem so innocuous. But in the, to in the moment you're making them and you're having this conversation, you don't think anything of it. You don't think anything of someone asking you where you grew up. You don't think anyone, anything of someone asking Oh, that's interesting. I had a cousin that lived there. Uh, what street did you grow up on? You don't think anything of them saying, wow, you might have been neighbors. What school did you go to? What are these questions that I'm asking you about here? Anyone recognize these? These are your password questions. To reset your password, they ask you things like, what street did you grow up on? Who was your first grade teacher? What was the name of your first dog? And coincidentally, these are a lot of the same types of getting to know you questions that people may ask and find a way to work into casual conversation. So before you have even realized that you may be getting scammed, someone may be working on you at that time to try and find information out about your passwords and about your personal information. Even if that isn't the goal, the conversations usually proceed to day-to-day -day updates, checking in every day. Almost always in these conversations that if you request to meet someone, hey, it would be great if we flew to your place or you flew to my place and we were able to hang out in person or talk in person, that's always rejected. Why is that? Because like, if they showed up, you'd realize it was some Russian guy in his 30s <laughs> and not the person you were expecting. But as these conversations progress, it turns into a daily thing, a daily check-in, how's it going, updates on your life, even if we aren't meeting, it's still nice to get that little dopamine hit of someone caring about you as your phone dings. And then almost inevitably in these types of conversations, it pivots to one of two directions. The first direction we're gonna talk about now. 
and that is the personal life tragedy or the personal life situation that this person has that necessitates them asking you for money. Uh, some of the ones I've seen before have been, I have a sick family member and I need to fly immediately across country to be with this person. Uh, can you help me out? It's gonna be $10,000 for a plane ticket and hotel. I will get you back as soon as my next check comes next month. Or um, emergency car repair, or some other type of personal tragedy. And it's always followed up with an ask to pay by what are called a non-traditional payment method. In this case, it is uh, on the text message here, it's Alipay. Has anyone ever heard of Alipay before? No. All right, it's the preferred method of payment for goods and services coming through China. So congratulations, you've never dealt with the Chinese Communist Party if you're not, if you're not using this. The second way that these scams pivot is into what are called investment scams. Investment scams are one of the highest grossing, uh, highest, uh, highest, uh, sorry, are one of the fastest growing types of scams along with romance scams. Investment scams are also another form of trust scams. The pivot in this case with the romance scam is that maybe instead of a personal tragedy, they want to talk to you about investing. How's your portfolio? My portfolio is doing great. Uh, we should talk about doing investments because I think I can really help you out with that. And again, by the time this conversation happens, you are weeks, months, or even years into knowing someone, and the idea that they don't have your best interest at heart, or that they are looking to take advantage of you at this point, is unfathomable. You may have missed the warning signs along the way, and that's the repeated attempts to meet up are rebuffed, the repeated attempts to talk via video conferencing are rebuffed. They may even, though, get through these types of requests. If they have determined that you have enough money to make it worth your while, they may hire someone to pose as them on a Zoom chat. We've seen that before. With the investment scam, it's always presented as a, I have these investment tips. It's a high reward, low risk investment. And if you ever hear high reward, low risk, you should immediately be suspicious. Yes, ma'am. What about the uh, ones that send me the card to come to dinner and they talk about investing in their company? Yeah. Yeah, like do not ever, 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 ever. The only thing, the only people you should ever be taking investment advice from is, a, is what's called a fiduciary. You guys know what a fiduciary is? A fiduciary is a person who is an investment uh, individual that has a legal and ethical duty to look out for your best interest as opposed to their best interest. If you're not talking about your investments with a fiduciary, you should be very, very careful about that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have a question. A lot of times on Facebook, if you comment on someone else's post, then I'll get a, a return comment saying, you need to contact this person and you will thank me later. Yes. <laughs> yes. Please, 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 please do not contact that person. You will be thanking no one later. I, I guarantee you that. Now, the scary thing about these investment scams is that they're morphing into something that exists beyond the romance scam as well. Like, for example, this was an actual text message. This is the newest slide in my presentation. This was an actual text message that was sent to my phone on February 24th, just a couple of weeks ago. Pretty innocuous, Saturday, 3.07 p.m. Hey, are you working tomorrow morning? How many people get text messages like this where you know, there, it just seems like it's probably a wrong number. It's becoming more prevalent, so watch out, please watch out for this. Now, what do you do when you get a text message like this? It's from a wrong number, but it's someone that thinks they know who they're talking to. Delete it. That's what I do. I, I ignore this. However, however, there is a subset of people, it may be you, if it is you, then this is a perfect time for us all to talk. There is a subset of people that will respond to that message, even with something as simple as, I think you have a wrong number. That can cause problems. First message, it came as a very innocent message. I said, wrong number. He came back, you look Chinese are you Chinese? And I said, yes. 
Jimmy said he was either 35 or 36. He's from Dalian, currently living in Los Angeles. He had moved here just before COVID and then COVID hit and so he's not able to go home. He was a, ah, a lonely man in need of comfort. So just from those types of innocuous text messages, just responding can lead to conversation. And the number one thing scammers want to do is they want to get you talking. They want to get you interacting with them. They want to get you speaking with them, either on the phone, via email, or via text message. Because if they can get you talking, they can start to build trust. They can start to build rapport. And once they do that, then problems start. Yeah. Tell them about the, um, the, the call you got yesterday when you were in your office. Oh, I, I'll get, uh, yeah, I'll get to that later. Okay. Yeah, that was, that was funny as well. Yeah. So if you look at the numbers right here, these investment scams have jumped from where they were in 2021 to 2022. Massive jump. And can anyone figure out why that is, or does anyone know why that is? There we go. That's the first time anyone's ever gotten that on the first shot to go through. The answer is Bitcoin. Um, everybody knows what bit, everyone's heard of Bitcoin right here? Yeah. yeah. No. Jimmy first brought up his dabbling in crypto, and he sounded like he knew what he was talking about. I refused him on numerous occasions. Crypto was something that I knew nothing about. I had always been very risk adverse with my investments. The spoiler alert for that documentary, and it goes way into detail, she does eventually invest in crypto with this individual who is a scammer. It's not a happy ending to that one, unfortunately. Cryptocurrency is a game changer for seniors. It is a game changer for scammers. Again, this is just one Google search. This is the first page of results on cryptocurrency scams. Cryptocurrency, here's your breakdown on Bitcoin. I could talk at length about Bitcoin. You would be bored to tears by the end of it, and it would be dark outside by the time we got through all of it. <laughs> so this is your crash course in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, what you need to know. Cryptocurrency is not real. It is an electronic form of money that was invented by people who, I don't want to call them financial anarchists because that might be a little too, they mostly were, but it was people who decided that money needed to be decoupled from government. The idea that money that is run by governments, the government can print more money, it can devalue the money that it has that the citizens own, and it would be better for society if money was not controlled by any one centralized authority. So therefore, Bitcoin is a completely decentralized form of currency. It exists only on the internet. It's based on computer algorithms. There is a limited supply of Bitcoin, which means that it can never go, be subject to inflationary pressures as more Bitcoin is created. You know going into Bitcoin how many Bitcoins there are to be mined out there is what they call it. But because Bitcoin is decentralized, it means that it is not traceable. There is no central bank that you can subpoena records for or get wire transfer records for to find out how Bitcoin moves. It happens anonymously over the internet. The owner of Bitcoin wallet number 5,433 transfers one Bitcoin to wallet holder 1,233,431. I don't know who those people are. You don't know who those people are. Someone may tell you, oh, I own this wallet and this is my number. There is no way for you to verify that. There is no bank you can call. There is no Bitcoin company you can call. There is no Mr. Bitcoin that I can subpoena into court to give testimony about how Bitcoins move back and forth. And because it is untraceable, Bitcoin is completely unrecoverable once it is sent. When you transfer money through a bank account, I can go to the bank, or an office, a police officer can go to the bank, or you can go to the bank and say, I need to stop this transaction. Or if it turns out it was fraudulent, police can go and say, okay, 
I see that you transferred this money to this place. I know where to look for that money when we prosecute someone for the crime. Or at the very least, we can get an order, a court order ordering that bank to transfer the money back because it was fraudulently sent. That's impossible with Bitcoin because we don't know who the people are, because there is no centralized regulating authority. Once Bitcoin is sent somewhere, it's never coming back. And when you combine those two things, that Bitcoin is untraceable and unrecoverable, it is the absolute perfect way for scammers to take money, because you can never get it back once it's been sent in Bitcoin. It's now the preferred method of scammers, especially scammers operating out of the country like we've talked about already. And the problem with this as well is that Bitcoin is now entering the physical world. Um, not in the sense of that you can get a dollar bill that's like a Bitcoin bill that is physical money, but the idea that it used to be in order to buy and sell Bitcoin, you needed to be tech savvy. You needed to know what websites to go to. You needed to know where to put your money. That isn't the case anymore. There are hundreds of apps that you can download on your phone that allow you to buy, sell, and trade Bitcoin. Some of these apps, in fact, are completely and wholly run by scammers. That the app is run by a scammer, that when you upload the money into the app, the money goes directly to a scammer, and the results it spits out about how your investments are doing are completely fabricated by the scammer. You can download an application from one of the app stores for phones, or go to a website that looks completely legitimate and never know that you have been scammed the second that the money leaves your account, that you never bought anything, you just transferred money to the scammer. But beyond that too, I don't know if you've seen this before, and I'm sorry that I'm gonna, now that you'll never be able to unsee this when you go out and about. When you go to get gas for your car, or go to the convenience store, or go to Walgreens, or go to the grocery store, by the entrance at most of these places, there is always what? There's an ATM by the entrance. The ATM is almost always from some knockoff third party. It's not from a bank you recognize. And the ATM withdrawal fee is usually like $7. They're using, they're using casino prices because they know that you're desperate for cash if you're using that ATM. Um, and now when you look at those ATMs, I want you to take a closer look when you walk by them. And I think what you're gonna see on most of them now is a sticker that has the Bitcoin logo on that ATM. And what these ATMs are now allowing you to do is they are allowing you to, to put money and deposit money into the ATM, sorry, allowing you to put money and deposit money into the ATM and convert it directly into Bitcoin at the ATM. There are now thousands of Bitcoin kiosks out there in the real world that you can go to to convert your money to Bitcoin. And scammers know this, and we're receiving reports and calls on our scam report line of people that are being instructed by scammers to whatever problem they need to solve, whatever payment they need to make. Uh, what I need you to do is take cash, go to the ATM at this place, and deposit this cash into the ATM to this Bitcoin account. We had a report, and this was back about three or four months ago, of an individual who was scammed out of over $5,000 who had been instructed to go to the Kroger in Coryville, right by UC. And he was, you, there's surveillance video of him just pumping $100 bills into this ATM like it was a slot machine. And it was all sent directly to a scammer. These uh, Bitcoin machines now have enabled scammers to take your money directly from cash to Bitcoin without you ever having to download an app, provide bank account information or anything like that. And that's dangerous because a lot of these app, a lot of these Bitcoin, legitimate Bitcoin sources, when you connect your bank account and you wire your money from your bank account to Bitcoin, your bank will flag that as a red flag transaction. They'll call you and say, um, it looks like you just tried to invest, put $10,000 into cryptocurrency. Are you sure you want to do that? You'll get the call from your, the fraud department at your bank. If they're taking cash at an ATM, no one in the fraud department is going to call to stop that transaction because it's just cash that you are putting into a machine. What I want you to take away from this conversation is that Bitcoin is a red flag. If anyone asks for payment in Bitcoin, it should be a red flag. If anyone asks you to send them Bitcoin for whatever reason, it's a red flag. There are legitimate ways you can invest in cryptocurrency. And if you want to invest in cryptocurrency, I am not a fiduciary, I am not a financial planner, I'm not going to give you advice on whether or not that's a good idea. But if you're going to invest in Bitcoin, 
please, please, please talk with someone that knows what they're talking about. Talk to your financial planner, talk to your bank, talk to someone that understands Bitcoin and, and view it with grave suspicion if anyone tries to talk to you about it that isn't a fiduciary or isn't your banker. Grandparent scams. This is probably the hottest type of scam in the media right now. How many people have heard about grandparent scams before? All right, just about everyone. The grandparent scam is one of the more nefarious types of scams going around right now. It involves people calling to pretend to be family members that are in trouble and need of immediate assistance. This is uh, where we take psychology pause number two right here in the talk. And that's that this is another type of scam where scammers are using our own brains against us. So I work in court uh, just about every day downtown when I'm not out here talking and, and speaking. My wife, God love her for marrying me because I'm a complete idiot. She is a high school biology teacher. She teaches AP biology. She's very, very smart. Dumb decision here, very smart otherwise in her life. <laughs> if I call her at 10 o'clock in the morning, when I know she's teaching, and I pick up my phone, I call her, she doesn't answer the first time because she's teaching, I call her again, what do you think the first words out of her mouth are when she picks the phone up? What's wrong? What is wrong? Our brains are predisposed to ask questions like that and jump to conclusions like that. Before she has even answered the phone, her immediate suspicion is that if he is calling me right now, something must be wrong. Very similarly with the grandparent scam, when you receive a call in the middle of the night, your phone is ringing at one in the morning, two in the morning, it wakes you up, your first thought when you go to answer that phone is something must be wrong. Something is wrong. And then when you pick up the phone and somebody tells you something is wrong, in that moment, without anything else happening, there is a small bond of trust that's been formed right there. Because you had an expectation about how this conversation would go, that there is a problem. And this person on the other end of the phone has confirmed your suspicion. They have give, that, you, that you were right. They have given you, in your mind, truthful information. You thought something was wrong. They told you something was wrong. This person must be telling the truth because they confirmed what I already thought. And you combine that with the idea that when you get woken up in the middle of the night to get a phone call, I'm not at my best when I'm just waking up. I barely know what direction and what day it is. Um, you combine those two things, and it makes us very, very susceptible to being misled at these, with these types of calls. The scammers almost always pick some sort of a problem that is imminent and, and in need of immediate attention. That can be someone who's been arrested is a big one. That can be a car accident or an emergency. Or even more insidious is when it's someone claiming to be a friend or a colleague of your son, daughter, granddaughter, grandson, to where any information they don't know about you in particular can be explained away by the fact that they are calling on behalf of someone who is in trouble. So that when you pick the phone up and they say, uh, Grandma, and you know that, oh, I go by Nana, I don't go by Grandma, it's excusable then at that point because it's their friend that's calling. Uh, these are insidious. Uh, in the original video we played at the start, these are scams that can cost people thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and I recorded a sample call of what this sounds like, and I want you to judge uh, my acting. Tell me how good I am at this, please. Grandma, it's your grandson. I'm in trouble right now and really need your help. The police showed up at my apartment earlier tonight and said some crazy stuff about me being involved in a drug dealing ring. I've never done drugs in my life. I think someone is using my, my address or my phone or something to try and frame me. I don't know, but they arrested me and now I'm in jail, okay? They're telling me that unless I can pay $10,000 for bail, that I could be in here for weeks waiting to see a judge. I'm so scared right now. They're saying that this is the only phone call I get. My roommate saw the entire arrest and is going to call you and let you know how to pay my bail. I need you to do exactly what he says and pay it quickly. And please don't tell mom and dad. I don't want to get them upset. I love you so much. Please help. 
All right, what do I get on that? Do I get like a C, B, what would I get? B. All right, you are, you are entirely too kind, and I will, I will pass your compliments on to the real person that recorded that phone call. That was not me. That was an artificial intelligence program doing the entire recording. That was based on 20 seconds of audio of me talking on my podcast about soccer, I think. And I uploaded that 20 seconds of audio to this website. It's called Eleven Labs. It costs $1 to sign up for, and then $5 a month after that. The script that was read, uh, that was from a program called ChatGPT, where I asked it to write a voicemail of a frightened grandson talking to his grandmother asking for bail money. Uh, you can play around with the settings as to how stable or how exaggerated the style is. And then you click the render button, and 90 seconds later, you have an audio file that just played there of my voice. So how many people here have heard of artificial intelligence before? All right, it's hot in, it's hot in the streets, as the kids say. Artificial intelligence is not the future Captain Kirk promised us. It is not C-3PO and R2-D2 or any other thing that you were expecting uh, when you thought about what life would look like in the future. What artificial intelligence is, is it is computer programs that learn to be better at doing things. That they are programmed to analyze and improve themselves at making something or doing some sort of a task. What you just heard right there was, was science fiction as recently as five years ago. If you wanted to recreate someone's voice from scratch saying something that they had never said before, it would have required an enormous amount of their voice, hours and hours of them speaking, and someone painstakingly cutting and pasting individual words together and then manipulating the audio to try and make it sound less like you're cutting and pasting words together. That was how you had to do this five years ago. Now with one dollar and 20 seconds of audio, I could make myself say the craziest things known to mankind. And that's frightening for any number of reasons. So I played this for my father and freaked him out. I called him with this and left this as a voicemail for him. And then to really freak him out, he, did, uh, he was on television and radio for a lot of time. And so there's a lot of his voice that's out there. I also left him a message as himself asking for himself, which was... <laughs> I might add that to the presentation at some point. I really wish I had his reaction to it too. That would have been real funny. Um, but for most people now, we, especially in my generation, we are a noisy generation. We put ourselves out there a lot on the internet, whether that is on Facebook videos, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, uh, YouTube, people have podcasts, people send videos to one another. It does not take a lot of someone's voice in order to do this, in order to get the ability to synthesize their speech. Now, there are limitations on this technology right now. As we stand right here, you still have to go to a website, you still have to have the voice, you still have to have the script that you want, and you have to upload it and wait for it to render and produce a file for you. That takes about, you know, Five minutes, give or take. But it can only say things that you've told it to say in advance and that you have a recorded audio file for. That's right now. You give it 18 months, five years, I would bet every dollar in my wallet that this technology will mature to the point where you can just type in real time and the computer will have that conversation with audio in somebody's voice or that there will be programs that will allow you to speak in your voice, and then it will immediately translate it into somebody else's voice for you. I would bet that that is a reality imminently. When that happens, that is going to be problematic for any number of reasons. In my line of work, I spent the almost 15 years as a criminal prosecutor, going to court, you know, convicting the bad guys for doing things. The idea that my job in the future will now require that I have to prove the confession for someone when they murder someone, they give a confession that I have to prove that's not AI, or that the defense attorney shows up in court and says, you have the wrong man. Uh, this person called my client and confessed over the phone. Here's the confession. Or the surveillance video, they're getting good with AI videos that we have video of the crime happening to prove that's not AI. 
as a society, we're not ready for this. Specifically, we're not ready for this sort of thing where anyone's voice can be uh, copied for any reason. It's not there yet, but it's getting there, which is why I tell people, please, please, please pay attention to stories about AI. If you see on, you're on the internet and there's a story about AI in the news, read it. Be aware of what the technology can do. Be aware of what the technology is going. And specifically with this, since I freaked my father out about this, now we have a family password that's something we say in conversations. It can be anything. It can be a word as simple as banana. Just something that only you know so that if there is an issue that comes up and it seems like it's an emergency, that I can verify to my father or to my sister or to my other family members that it's really me talking, that an AI can't fool, an AI can fool my voice, but it can't replicate the words that I'm saying and if it doesn't know what the family password is. So this is one of those where just watch this space when it comes to AI. It can, it's going to change everything and the inform, more informed you are, the better it is. How many people here shop online? All right, this is one of the oldest scams going. Um, if you shop online, we see reports constantly of people where I paid for this and I got that. Um, I was expecting this, they sent me this instead, or they didn't send anything at all. Um, where this usually happens is on unregulated marketplaces like Facebook Market, Nextdoor, and Craigslist. If you use these types of services, you should be aware and you should know that these types of services are not guaranteed. Uh, all they're doing is they're offering you a place to meet other people to do personal transactions. So if you get scammed on one of these websites, there is no way to go to the website and say to Facebook, uh, I got scammed on your marketplace, I want a refund. They won't do that. It's in the terms of service that you agree to when you shop on there. So be very, very careful when you are shopping on places like this. Uh, the phrase caveat emptor is the one they teach us in law school. Anyone know Latin here at all? Let the buyer beware is what that stands for. Uh, these specifically, Facebook Marketplace is rife with scammers. And so that's definitely one where if you're going to go on there, at the very least, be careful about what you're buying. And also, just as a personal safety tip, the number of cases we end up with downtown where people are going to meet up for a transaction and then get robbed is off the charts. Um, uh, Nextdoor, Let Go is another one. That's another website this happens on. Many police departments now offer safe areas to do transactions if you're buying and selling from individuals. So contact your local police department. You can do it here at Forest Park. You can do it here at Forest Park. So you guys are already thinking ahead here. Uh, if you are going to meet up to buy something from someone, insist that you go someplace like that that is a police department area where it is well monitored, well lit. Bring a friend with you and buyer beware. Those are the scams we're going to talk about. And before we get into some tips, this is the last part of this, the scamming part that I always have to bring up, and this isn't fun. And that's that if you look at the numbers, and the research is pretty clear on this, the number one perpetrator of crimes against the elderly are family members. Um, it's sad to think about, but it's in fact the truth. The uh, literature refers to these as EFFEs, which is elder, finan uh, elder family financial exploiters. And they all fit a certain profile. And so what you can do is you can look for this type of profile in both your family members and more specifically in friends so that you can watch out for signs that a family member may be exploited by someone living locally with them. And these are the people we can prosecute when we find out about this. Uh, I can tell you with almost absolute certainty that someone that exploits a family member falls into one of these categories. They're usually someone that's had a difficult time holding down a steady job their entire life. Usually that's because there's a history of substance abuse or a history of incarceration at some point. There has been a long-term financial dependence on their family members as well. Because they've never held down a job, they have to rely on grandma, grandpa, or mom and dad to support them. They usually justify this by saying, I am taking care of them, and they're providing me an allowance for doing this. And the number one red flag in almost all of these cases when a financial, uh, an elderly individual is going to be financially exploited by a family member is a sense of entitlement to money. The attitude that the family member has of expressed in ways like, uh, we don't want to put mom and dad into this uh, treatment home or this retirement home. That will eat up all of the inheritance. Or I'm the person that stayed behind to look after mom and dad. I should be the one that gets the majority of their money. I earned this. This is, my, this is actually mine. When you hear things like this, 
it is an enormous red flag that this person is going to attempt to do something that is financially exploitative. These are the people we can prosecute. These are the people I really like prosecuting because there is nothing scummier than taking advantage of your family completely. So I've given you a lot of bad news. It's been a little scary from time to time. This is the portion where we pivot, and I want to talk to you guys about things that you can do to make yourself a harder target to prevent yourself from being scammed, beyond just having the tools to recognize when scams are happening. So these are my tips. These are tips that are sourced out there from experts. The goal is to have things that you can do that do not require you to change your life dramatically. We don't want you to have to throw your computer out the window, dig a moat around your house, and barricade yourself inside. The goal is to not force you to live off the grid. We want you to live happy, productive lives, enjoying everything that's out there, but maybe just being smart about the ways that scammers can impact your life and making it a little harder for them to do that for you. Tip number one is, does anyone here use a home health worker or have home health aides in their house that come in? Okay, so we got a couple people here. If you are planning to have a home health aide work in your house or come and take care of yourself or a family member, be very, very careful about where you hire these individuals from. Never hire them through the newspaper, the one ads, or from someone who knows someone that does this and is looking for work. Uh, use reputable agencies. If you need help to find a reputable agency for a home health aide, the Council on Aging, Meals on Wheels, AARP, they can all be tremendous assets in this space to help you connect with a company that is reputable for providing a home health aid. Why is that? Because all of these scams we've talked about so far, they are all about scammers trying to get access to some portion of your life, either your money or your personal information. When you invite someone into your house as a home health worker, open the door for them, you have done the hard part of the scammer's job for them. You have given them access to your home. You have given them access to everything that's inside your home. So we want to be very, very careful about the people we are inviting into our home, especially when there's, they're going to be asked to do things like watch and care for us while we're taking a nap or when we're not going to be around and paying attention to what it is that they're doing at all times. The other troubling part of this is that this industry is rife with, I'll say, bad hiring practices. Uh, a lot of agencies that employ home health workers and send out home health workers do not drug screen, which is a major problem because we find that when we catch these people that are committing crimes as home health workers, substance abuse is almost always going part and parcel with that. And also, many of these companies don't check skills uh, of the employees they're hiring. It's just, if your resume lists you can do something, we're taking your word from that. We're not actually checking that. So make sure that you're using reputable companies when you are, in fact, hiring home health workers. Tip number two, if you keep valuables at your house, keep an inventory list of the valuables you have at your house. And that includes taking photographs of what you have in the place where it is. So if you keep your jewelry in a specific drawer, make a list of everything you have, take pictures of everything that you have, and then take pictures of it in the place that it is. This is in case something ever happens to you with someone in your home or with a family member or anything like that, that you will have a record of what your property is, where it is located, and so that when something goes missing, you will be easily able to document that I know that I had this on this date, it was in this place, and it makes it very easy for you to then track where your personal property is. And if you don't already have one, I do recommend that if you keep valuables in your home that you invest in a safe, a fireproof safe for not only your valuables but your personal documents as well. That can include your will, that can include your financial documents, that can include your passport, social security card, anything important that you need to keep. Uh, these are all things that can be incredibly compromising if other people have, and they can also be devastating to lose if something is to happen at your home. Uh, safes are relatively inexpensive online. You can buy them at the Home Depot or Lowe's as well. Make sure they're fireproof. Does anyone here have a safe deposit box that they use? Okay, a couple of people. I don't have a problem with safe deposit boxes. The only thing to know about having a safe deposit box is number one, your homeowner's insurance does not cover the contents of a safe deposit box if something happens. The bank's insurance also does not cover the content of a safe deposit box as well. You have to get separate insurance for the contents of your safe deposit box. And the other thing to be aware of as well is that many new bank branches, when they knock a bank down or they move it to a new location, many new bank branches are not being built with vaults. So if you have a safe deposit box at a bank, 
and that branch closes, or they build a new bank there, oftentimes your safe deposit box will be transferred to other banks in the region. So just keep an idea and keep tabs on where your safe deposit box is located. Just because I had someone that I represented as a private client, which we are allowed to do, and her safe deposit box ended up being moved uh, completely across town because her bank branch closed and they relocated her box to the nearest bank that had a vault. So just be aware if you are using a safe deposit box. Yes? Also, safe deposit boxes are being uh, discontinued by... <coughs> they are. So if you don't have one, it's in your best interest to get one as soon as you can hold on to it. Yeah. If you are inclined to get a safe deposit box, yes. they. Far fewer banks than ever before have them. Banks don't like them. They're not money makers like they were uh, years ago. So if you're inclined to get one, walk, don't run, don't walk. Yes, ma'am. Also, if your will or living will or important papers are in a safe deposit box at your demise or passing, it would be necessary to go through probate court to get them out. That's absolutely true. So if you have a safe deposit box and your will is in the safe deposit box, you have to go to the probate court and there's a special form you have to file and a filing fee you have to pay called, because uh, without the will, you can't prove who the executor of the estate is, so you have to then pay the court to get authorization to go to the bank to get the will out of the safe deposit box. Even if you know what the will says, uh, you still have to do that. The Hamilton County Probate Court also offers a service called Wills on Demand or Wills on File, where you can take your will down to probate at any time, file it with the probate court. They keep it under seal. It's not a public record. And then only when someone presents a death certificate, they can get your will from the probate court itself. It's actually a really, really great service. Our local probate court is phenomenal. Yes? Same thing? Same thing. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am? Um, my son is my power of attorney. And I have sent, I'm going to be sending him copies of the power of attorney, my will, and in other words, documents showing that he can do this, he will have it with him, so in case when I yep. expire, he has it. Yeah, always, if there is someone, always send them copies, but keep your original someplace safe. That's absolutely smart. Tip number three, if you still get paper statements, bank statements, paper records, secure documents you get that have your personal identifying information on them. How many people here still get paper statements from their bank or their financial? Okay, the majority of the people here. That's fine. Um, electronic paper, it's, it's entirely a personal preference. If you get paper statements though, uh, what I want you to do is invest in a shredder and shred personal documents after you get them. Uh, that includes anything that has your address, your name, your social, your bank account numbers, or even the institution where you bank at. Just knowing that you bank at Fifth Third is already doing some of the work for a potential scammer or a thief because they now know where to target in terms of trying to get your login information or your account information. So any information that has your name on it, just as a rule, shred the document. Um, it is way too easy uh, for these sorts of things to end up in the wrong hands otherwise. It doesn't even have to be from someone working in your home. It can just be, we had a blustery day the other day, and your trash can tips over, and all of a sudden, a uh, bank statement is out there blowing in the wind. And it's just, it's for your own peace of mind and your own protection. Yes, ma'am. Now, you can also uh, glue or whatever you do to the shredded stuff. Yeah, I always say, what, get what, a, what we do is get the garbage can, the big barrel, and <laughs> that way you don't eat that is, that's, you do what you got to do. The other thing you can do is they sell shredders now that are crisscross shredders where it doesn't just come into a strip. It actually crisscross shreds it. And if you can glue back little pieces of paper that are this big, the, you can have my money if you want to go through that kind of an effort. Yeah. My son, I, I have a shredder. But he said, Mom, the best thing to do with the stuff that you shred is put it, with your, put it in the bag of the kitty litter. Yeah. <laughs> I don't just pour really bad beer on top of it too. That'll work. Yeah. Um, you get a lot of promotional stuff for credit cards and stuff like that, and it has your name on it. Shred it. Oh. I would shred anything that has your name on it. I would especially shred credit card applications because if anyone sees those, they can grab those and fill them out for you. Oh, okay. Tip number four: monitor your credit. How many people here check their own credit? 
This is awesome. I'm so glad to see so many hands up. Uh, your banks and your credit cards offer free credit reporting services. Check your credit once every six months just to see what's going on. That'll be the first way that you can alert that someone may have access to your personal information. And if you are satisfied with where you are in life and you're not planning on making any big purchases or taking out any new lines of credit, consider freezing your credit. Your bank can help you with this. Pro Seniors can help you with this. It takes about a half hour. You freeze your credit. And once you do that, no one can open any new lines of credit in your name. You always have the ability to unfreeze your credit at a later date. And it does not impact anything you currently have. Your credit cards will still work. Your mortgage will still be fine. Your car note will still be fine. It just prevents new lines of credit from being opened in your name. And your bank can help you with that. Tip. Yes, ma'am. Once you freeze it, do you have to call and unfreeze it? Yes. It stays frozen until you unfreeze it. Uh, tip number five. This may be the most important one I, I tell you today, other than Bitcoin is bad. Um, Never, ever, ever, please don't answer numbers that you don't recognize. If you don't, answer, if you don't know who's calling, please don't answer the phone. If you have an iPhone or a smartphone, almost all of them have a feature in the settings on the, under phone where you can silence unknown callers. And what that does is it sends the call directly to voicemail if that number isn't in your phone book. And then you have the ability then to listen to the voicemail. It'll still give you a notification that someone left you a message and then you can return the call at your convenience. One of, the one of the biggest things scammers rely on is when they get you on the phone, they know the purpose of the call. You don't. You're on defense, they're on offense. And as anyone that watches sports knows, it's way easier to play offense than it is to play defense. The wide receiver knows where the route is going. The defensive back has to react. That's why it's so much harder to play DB than wide receiver. So please uh, consider doing this. Return calls at your convenience when you are prepared to take the call and when you are prepared to know what the, call, the subject of the call is going to be. And remember, if it is important, they're going to leave you a message. They're going to leave you a message. I understand this is a generational thing. My, my grandmother used to get on me all the time about how rude it is to not answer the phone. I don't care. I'm a lawyer. I'm supposed to be a jerk. Like, I'm just living up to the stereotype. And when you call people back, please, please, please call them back on their known number. If you get a voicemail from an unknown number and they claim to be a friend, a relative, a colleague, grandma, grandson, whomever, call them back on the number that you have in the phone book for them. You know what they say 99% of the time when you call them? I never called you. I didn't call you. Tip number six here. Um, I don't know how much more plainly to say this. The government never calls you asking for money. The government will never, ever call you wanting to give you money. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. The IRS doesn't give people free money. Um, every branch of government, from the president of the United States to the dog catcher, does business via the mail. If you owe money to the government, they are going to send you a letter. If they're going to give you money, they are going to send you a letter. And there is never, ever, ever a situation where you need to respond in 48 hours to the government. The government, the, the government talks in terms of six months to a year. The gov nothing is ever urgent with the government. Um, if you have jury duty, you'll receive a notice in the mail. If you miss jury duty, you'll receive a notice in the mail. The government does not do business over the phone. If you get a phone call from someone claiming to be from the government, especially relating to money, I want you to just hang the phone up and wait for a letter to arrive. So those calls that are coming from the police department are not real? Not real. <laughs> not real. <laughs> Tip number seven. If you are going to hire a contractor for your home or your residence, research who you are hiring through the Better Business Bureau. This is much the same as home health aides. Contractors or another group of people where we open the door to our homes for these people. We're doing the hard work already. We're allowing them in. Please do your research. Please make sure you know who you're hiring. Get estimates before you hire a contractor. Take photos of the work and insist on a written contract from the uh, contractor before any work is done. And please be incredibly suspicious of contractors who keep asking you for more money. I had a case I prosecuted back in September of a wonderful woman 
who had paid a contractor $10,000 for landscaping report work and to redo her driveway. This contractor jackhammered her driveway, disappeared for five days, then reappeared saying, I would love to finish your project, ma'am, but you'll never believe it. Someone stole all of my tools out of the back of my truck, <laughs> and it's going to cost me $5,000 to get my tools repaired. And if I can do that, I can finish your work for you next week. And she paid him the money, and he disappeared. She called the police. We got the police to arrest this individual for theft. And then she was driven down to court by a friend. She sat at court for over three hours, waiting for the case to be called on the day of the trial. And because the defendant in this case had been let out on bond by the judge, he no-showed and is still on the run. And she had to sit there all morning and rely on someone else to drive her to court all for nothing. And I was heartbroken having to explain to her, I'm sorry, he just gets away with this for now. So please be careful and cautious of contractors. Tip number eight. I underline the word never here because I really want it to be important. Never donate to a charity that calls you over the phone asking for money. I'm going to say that again. Never donate to a charity over the phone when they call you and ask for money. Reputable charities will never pressure you to donate over the phone. They just don't do it. If you get a call from someone that is claiming to be from a charitable organization, what I want you to say is, no thank you, or please send me some information in the mail and I'll consider it. And then once you do that, go research the charity. Figure out if it's real, figure out what the situation with it is, and then make a decision on your own time as to whether or not you believe this is a good use of your money to donate. And again, I can't stress it enough. The good charities will not pressure you to donate over the phone right there on this call. And the other thing about this too is I want you to be cognizant of this as well. Reputable police and fire charities no longer solicit by phone. They don't do it anymore. They don't pressure you to donate by over the phone because there are so many impersonator charities now for police and fire that are just scams that they don't even engage in that type of solicitation any longer. If you get a call from an organization claiming to be from a police, a fire, or a military charity, I want you to hang the phone up. I want you to hang the phone up immediately. Um, and these types of charitable scams, they always happen whenever there's a tragedy that happens around the world. So if there was just a bunch of tornadoes that happened last night in the northern part of Ohio, I can guarantee you there will be an increase in call volume now of unsolicited calls for charities that are all completely bogus. When we had the unfortunate uh, incident over in the Middle East when Hamas attacked Israel back in October, there was a huge increase in charitable calls about international relief. When Israel invaded uh, Gaza, the calls peaked again. These people understand that when we are paying attention to bad things happening around the world, it offers them an opportunity. I want you to hang the phone up. Yes, ma'am. Um, if you get a call from someone or a charity, and if you refuse to take the call, isn't it necessary to give your name and address to them? If they're calling you, they should already have your address. Yeah, if you, if you knew enough to call me, then you know how to get a hold of me sending me something. Yeah, don't give your address. But if they're giving you an unsolicited call, mail me something. And if they don't have your address, that should tell you all you need to know about what this charity is right here. Tip number nine. If you get an email that says there's a problem with your computer, we talked about this already, what do we do? Ignore it. Um, if you do need to have your computer worked on, please take it somewhere to a company or a place that is reputable in dealing with computers. Uh, I have a Mac. I take my computer to the Apple store when there's a problem. You can go to the Geek Squad for Best Buy or do what most people do and ask a son or a grandson to come over and help you out. <laughs> Tip number 10, please never pay for anything where you are requested for, when you have been requested to pay money. Never pay for anything with cash, a gift card, cryptocurrency, or by wire transfer. Now, there's a little caveat to this. If you're going up to the store and you need to leave cash at the store, you want to pay for a restaurant with cash, that's fine. I am just talking about situations where people are asking you to pay money for some sort of a good or a service or something that is happening, especially over the phone or over the internet, whatever it is, if someone is asking you for cash, a gift card, crypto, or a wire transfer, you should view that with the gravest form of suspicion. 
Scammers love gift cards. Gift cards are kind of the original version of cryptocurrency in this way. Um, they don't ask for it as much now that, now that crypto is a thing, but it used to be that almost every form of scam would ultimately end in them asking for a gift card. Um, your grandson is in prison and needs to pay bail money. I need you to send me $500 in Amazon gift cards. Um, my wife's very, very good friend, she was a bridesmaid in our wedding. Her father has been working for years at a very, very important corporation downtown that I'm not going to name. He's very high up in that corporation, and he got a phone call about six months ago from someone claiming to be from the credit card company that his corporate account is on. And they told him that there is a charge on here that appears to come from a gentleman's club in another city. And because of your policy at your company, we have to report this charge unless it's paid immediately. And so he made the mental calculation in that space that it would be easier to just pay this than have to explain what happened. Or like that he was scammed or like defend himself. So they told him, we need you to send us $500 in iTunes gift cards. I guess they were gonna, <laughs> I guess they were gonna listen to some jams and you know, don't know what kind of music they were listening to. But he was driving to the store. This is a person, you know, college educated, working for a company, supervising a lot of people. He was on his way to Walgreens to buy gift cards, and midway through, he just sort of stopped at a red light and thought, what in the hell am I doing? <laughs> but the fact that he got in his car at all is proof that this can happen to anyone. But if they're asking you for a gift card, gift cards are for one thing, and that's buying gifts for people that are hard to buy for, okay? <laughs> Everyone gets me gift cards because I'm hard to buy for. That's the only reason to buy a gift card. If anyone asks you for a gift card for payment or to do something, the government doesn't want gift cards. You know, the IRS doesn't want gift cards. They want your money. If you have someone asking for a gift card, please, please, please view it with suspicion. Yes, ma'am. Um, how safe is using PayPal? PayPal is actually very safe. That's a great question. The question was how safe is using PayPal? PayPal and Venmo specifically are very safe. They have anti-fraud protection, however, when you are using PayPal or Venmo, most of the time now, how many people here use PayPal or Venmo? Okay, so if you use PayPal or Venmo, I want you to be aware of this though, that there are always with both these apps two ways to pay someone. You can either pay someone as a friend or you can pay someone as a transaction. If you pay someone as a transaction, there is a service fee that is on the money. It's like 2%, I think. But when you do that, you activate their anti-fraud protection. So if you are just sending money to someone because, oh, you know, I know this person, I owe him 50 bucks because he picked up the check and used it on his credit card, don't pay the service fee, just send them the money, it's very safe. If a contractor or someone is asking you for money with Venmo, it's safe, but make sure you click on the mode that like, allows it to be something where you can get the transaction back. Okay, I use PayPal for, to pay, just pay Instead of giving me my credit card, I use my PayPal credit card. Yeah. And so you're saying there's a fee on that, but I've never received a fee from PayPal. If you're using the app, if you're using a credit card from PayPal to pay, that's different. If you're using the app with PayPal to pay, there's always a, there's a mode that it's like one is for business transactions, one is for personal transactions. Make sure you're using the business transaction feature if it's someone that you're paying for a service. Yes? If you get a scam from PayPal, and you try to forward it to PayPal for them to look at, you will immediately get three new scams. Absolutely. They are reading what PayPal gets somehow. What it is, is there's a really long and convoluted reason for this, and that's that um, the scam usually has data in the email that can detect whether or not it's been sent to someone. And so once they realize there's an actual person interacting with it, that's like a green light for them to start doing more scams, which is why when you get those emails, please just delete them. Just delete them immediately. Don't let them keep passing on through the chain. Yes? Um, regarding, regarding PayPal, I have received like, some messages in my email saying they were from different people. Delete. Saying how much they, when I called PayPal, and they, they told me the link to send to them, and they appreciated me calling. Yeah, you can definitely report them, but the, the easiest thing, if you don't want to take the time to report them, just delete them. So it's like what PayPal allows people to do is they allow, them to allow people to request money from you, and so you'll see sometimes that like, you'll get a request in for $500 from someone because they're just fishing to find out if you'll pay. I had a friend of mine who is, um, I won't name because this is being recorded, who his brother, uh, 
His brother lived in San Francisco, and when his brother was out consuming some adult beverages, and he would get a car, he'd get like an Uber or a Lyft, he would always send a fare split to his brother here in Ohio, just hoping he would accidentally hit accept and pay for half of his ride. <laughs> Much the same way as that. Yes, sir? Gift cards. these gift cards, how do you know they're not already corrupted? When you buy a gift card, if you buy a gift card at the store, you should always look on the back of it to make sure that it doesn't have the part that you scratch off with the extra numbers. There's always a, um, a part on the gift card that you scratch off with the security code. Make sure that that hasn't been scratched off right there. That's the easiest way to make sure it's legitimate. Yes, sir? Have you had any problems with uh, Cash App? I don't use Cash App. I'm not familiar with Cash App. I would be talking out of turn on that. Uh, the ones that I am familiar with that do good work are Venmo and PayPal. So I'm, I would be completely speculating when it comes to Cash App, unfortunately. Yes, ma'am? Um, the other day I received from Messenger, I believe it was, um, a message, and it was supposed to be from a friend of mine. It had her picture on it. Sorry, yeah. Saying Sorry. that... Scan lightly on my phone right now. It's really ironic. Um, <laughs> saying that um, they were a senior, and they had received um, monies from this organization. Yeah. And um, asked me if I was aware of it, and I said, no, I'm not. Then they sent a person's name, and a telephone number, and a link for me to click. Delete, please. <laughs> I think that like, of all the users on Facebook, I think at least half of them are just scammers. I don't think they're actually real people. If you're going to pay for things online, I want you to please use a credit card. Please use a credit card that has a reliable anti-fraud policy and a cancellation on charges policy. I'm not paid by American Express. I do all my business on American Express because their anti-fraud department are gangsters when it comes to getting your money back when something goes wrong. Uh, there's a lot of good people that operate in this space. So please, if you're paying for something online, make sure it's through a method where you can get your money back and stop the charges if something goes wrong or you do make a mistake. Now, how many people here have a smartphone, like an iPhone or an Android? Okay, so if you have a smartphone, anywhere you bank at, no matter what major bank you have, no matter what credit card you have, they have an app you can download, you can log into, and you can set up so that you get notifications on your phone every time your account is accessed or you have a charge. I have it set up on my phone that anytime my SkyMiles card gets used, I get a notification immediately as soon as it's run for where it was and how much it's for so that I can always monitor when charges happen. But more importantly, to know when charges don't happen. Because another type of scam that we deal with and we get reports of are called cancellation scams. Uh, how many people here have ever received an email thanking them for signing up for a service that they don't remember signing up for? Okay. This is an actual email that got sent to me. It is notification of subscription renewal. Congratulations, your PC and network subscription have been renewed successfully. Uh, the service charge of $389.99 was successfully processed from the updated account fund and will reflect on your statement in a few hours. Well, I know that I didn't get any alerts on my phone that indicated that any transaction had happened. I also don't have a PC, I have a Mac. I would never subscribe to this <laughs> at all. Now, in this email, there are very telltale signs that something is wrong. Like, for example, it's from a Gmail account. There aren't a lot of professional businesses that will email you from a Gmail account. It also says the statement will be processed in a few hours. Well, a few hours had passed and nothing was on my statement. I know now that this is bogus. But it tells me, feel free to contact us if there's a problem at this number that looks kind of like a 1-800 number, but really isn't. <clears throat> the goal of this is that they want me to call. And who do you think I get connected to when I call this number? A scammer. And what they will tell you is they will say, oh, it appears this subscription was in error. What we need for you to do is we need you to provide us a bank account where we can send the refund back to. <laughs> and it will process in a few hours. Uh, but first, we need to verify that you actually have control of this account. Can you please send us $100 to verify the account? And then we will refund you the $389 plus the original 100 they send this email to hundreds of thousands, to millions of people. It only takes a couple for them to get rich. How, 
You just got one? Yeah. yeah. Same amount. Yeah, they're, they're, they're persistent little buggers. If, how many people here still write personal checks? You write checks? Okay. If you still write checks, just take some steps in order to make sure that you're protecting yourself. A uh, scam that we're seeing more and more of, it's an old, old scam, it's called check washing. There was a movie about this about 15, 20 years ago called Catch Me If You Can with Leonardo DiCaprio where he played a very famous person that did this for a living of changing checks and forging checks. What they do is they take your check, they use, ink, they use special chemicals to wash the ink off, and then they rewrite the check to themselves or to whoever they want to, and then they get money that way. But forced, in order to do this, they need one of your checks. How do they get your checks? Well, it's a number of ways. First off, they can steal them out of your mailbox. So please, if you are mailing a check, do not put the red flag up in your mailbox. Just generally speaking, don't send mail through your mailbox. If the red flag is up, that is an invitation to anyone walking down the street that there is something interesting in there that they may want to take, get their hands on. We already have enough problems with porch pirates as it is. Also, if you uh, get replacement checks, consider having your replacement checks mailed to your ha or at the bank directly. Go to the bank, don't have them mailed to your house. The reason why is that it is incredibly easy to see that the bank has sent you replacement checks. They do not disguise these. Anyone that knows what they're looking for knows exactly what replacement checks look like. The problem with this as well is that mail is not as secure as it used to be. So there was just a story in the Inquirer a couple days about this. There have been a rash of uh, robberies of postal employees, and one of the things they steal from postal employees is the key that they have that accesses the blue mailboxes. Those are universal keys. One key will open every mailbox within the greater Cincinnati area. The reason why is, is that, well, if you know, Jim can't be at work today and we need Tom to cover his route, we don't want to have Tom have to drive to Jim to get his key so that he can go pick up all the mail. We want one key that does everything for that. So unfortunately, we have seen some instances where people are breaking into mailboxes and stealing the mail using these keys. So if you are mailing a check, I would encourage you to drop it off at the post office itself. Like go into your postal branch, drop the check off there. If you are writing checks, please use a gel-based pen. My wife can explain why this is the case, but they are so much harder to wash off in terms of check washing with gel-based pens. <laughs> Tip number 13, please do not give out your Medicare information Thankfully, they have decoupled your Medicare number from your Social Security number, but even still, if your Medicare number is compromised, it can cause a lot of problems for you. Not financial problems, just headaches. Because what scammers will do with your Medicare number is they will bill the government for services fraudulently, and then if you need those services, the government will then say, well, we've already provided that, and then you get lost in federal hell, for lack of a better word, having to deal with proving to Medicare that you got scammed. So treat your Medicare number like your Social Security number, and please only give it out to people who are licensed professionals, reputable professionals. And if someone calls you soliciting free information from you or free devices or free things, please don't give your Medicare information out over the phone to people. Tip number 14, if you are going to use a power of attorney, please be aware of what the power of attorney says and consult with a lawyer or a trusted advisor before doing it. We are seeing a rise downtown in cases where powers of attorney are obtained fraudulently from seniors. This is also where we talk about home health care workers as well. There has been a spate of cases recently where home health care workers have convinced seniors to sign power of attorney over to them on the promise that they will be able to help them run errands. I can help run errands, I can go to the bank for you, I can do this for you, but I need a power of attorney. And then what happens is, is we get into scams where people, you know, take out reverse mortgages on houses, attempt to deed houses out from underneath people, a power of attorney allows that to happen. So please, please, please talk with an attorney or someone trusted for, before you sign a power of attorney. My final tip, and you've been lovely for listening to me all today, I appreciate your patience as we get all through this, is I want you guys to talk. I want you guys to talk with one another. I want you guys to talk with your friends, your family members. This topic has a stigma around it, like we talked about it right at the start of this. And I want to break that stigma. So please tell other people what you've learned, tell other people not to be ashamed. If you fall for a scam, I want you to not be ashamed of that fact. It happens to quite literally everyone, from every age demographic, every gender, every race, every religion, every creed. And this does not discriminate. They are after everyone because we all have the thing they want and that's money. The money is agnostic and they will target anyone that has it. 
So please, please, please do not feel ashamed. And if someone confides in you that they have been scammed, I want you to be compassionate with people who tell you that. I want you to tell them it's okay. I don't want you to shame them. I don't want you to blame them. We learn as prosecutors and people in law enforcement that how people are treated when they report being a victim will forever influence how they behave in the future. If people are met with anger, derision, or disbelief, it will make them less likely to report in the future because no one cared when they came forward and said something. So be compassionate. Offer to help. Offer to talk. Offer to work them through steps that can maybe help their situation out. Don't blame them. Don't shame them. And certainly, please, 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 don't suggest there is something wrong with them for falling for a scam because it can quite literally happen to anyone. And if you find out information about a scam, I want you to give us a call and I want you to report it. Uh, 946 scam. We have a dedicated representative that is answering this line during business hours. If you're not there, it's after business hours. Leave a message. We'll get back with you. I can't promise we'll solve the problem. I can't promise we'll prosecute. But at the very least, we can help connect you with resources to help the situation. And at worst, uh, your story can help be a teaching experience for other people when we do sessions like this. So I want to thank you all for listening to me. I really appreciate it. Uh, it seems like everyone's out to get you when you listen to a presentation like this, but there are way more good people in this world than there are bad people. And they count on the fact that we don't talk and we don't stand up to them to do what they do. So thank you very much. That was great information. Um, how many of you are going to go home and hide under the bed now? <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> <laughs>